Hello and welcome to Finally Friday. This chat session is run by EXARC, the Society for Archaeological Open Air Museums, Experimental Archaeology, Ancient Technology and Interpretation. My name is Matilda Siebrecht and today I am joined by two specialists from our EXARC community focusing on archaeological textiles. Alexandra Makin is a professional embroiderer and archaeologist who has a PhD from the University of Manchester. Her research focuses on the development of fabric and material production, and decision-making processes associated with embroidery production and its meaning within the early medieval period. As well as her research, Alex is also involved in public outreach, both in person as well as written articles and blogs. Ronja Lau has recently completed her master's at the Freie Universität in Berlin, where she analyzed the textile remains from Iron Age Hallstatt sites, and is particularly interested in the origins of textile technologies. In addition to archaeological analysis, Ronja has completed several clothing reproductions and incorporates experimental archaeology into her research focus. Like Alex, she is also interested in public outreach, and in fact, the two speakers today are working together on a new blog, which uh, we will probably discuss at some point later in the episode. So welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for making it today. I have a quick question to start you off, quite an easy one. How did you first become involved in textile research? So I've been involved in textiles and embroidery and knitting and things like that ever since I can remember. Uh, my mum knitted and made clothes and things, as did my grandma and all my cousins and all my aunts did as well. So for me, it's just something that you do and it's an innate part of me and one facet of my personality, really. I suppose it was a natural progression for me after I finished school to go to the Royal School of Needlework and study embroidery and then to eventually, after a very winding path, become a textile archaeologist. What about you, Ronya? I had a, uh, some kind of a different way because I actually started before I studied archaeology with a living history and reenactment. And through this hobby, I experienced that, you know, reenactors want to do a lot of themselves. So I started sewing and weaving. And through this, uh, when I started studying archaeology, it was very clear in which direction I wanted to go. So I always try to, you know, connect everything I learned uh, during my studies with uh, textile archaeology. And this never really was that easy because there are very few opportunities learning something about textile archaeology at my university because no one is educating the students about this topic. So that's sometimes very difficult. I had that as well because when I did my archaeology undergraduate degree, that wasn't on the syllabus at all. And it was only because I was really interested in embroidery and I was based up at Newcastle upon Tyne and I went down to Durham Cathedral, which is a 20 minute drive away. And I saw the Cuthbert's embroideries, the embroideries that were discovered in the tomb of St. Cuthbert on display there. And I suddenly realised that, oh, actually, maybe I could study this. Maybe I could do something. Um, linked to embroidery and archaeology, combining two passions in my life, really. And so I kind of fell into that aspect of it on the back of that visit, really. Well, that's really nice, yeah. I, I don't know, I maybe have the issue that I think it's difficult or it was difficult for me to learn all this by myself because I think it would be easier if someone in the university would have told me well in textile archaeology you do this and that and this method and you don't do this and you have to learn that. So I really was struggling at first when I started learning prehistoric uh, sewing techniques because well I couldn't ask someone. I was very young when I started uh, sewing. I mean I have like a when I started reenactment, I was 16, so I didn't know anyone in the textile archaeology community and stuff. And I had no opportunity to also really learn like a tailor or something. So this was really difficult. But I think the experience I gained through all those, you know, crafting by myself is actually quite nice because I made a lot of mistakes and you have to be really honest to say, well, I don't know everything and I will still don't know everything in 10 years. So there's a lot of possibilities to learn something new and this won't change in the next year. So that's actually quite nice. Yeah, I totally agree with you. 
I'm still learning and definitely about things linked to textile archaeology because obviously up to now my focus has been mainly early medieval embroidery and I've been really focused on that so I'm now having to or not having to I'm wanting to expand my horizons and learn um, about textile archaeology so I'm now um networking and trying to meet people through conferences and things like that um, in order to see if they will help me learn and develop and things and I found quite a lot of people have been really helpful and positive and they want to teach you and they want to pass on their skills and things like that which is fantastic but I noticed your work involves a lot of analysis and using computer programs and things like that whereas I'm I don't know anything about that sort of thing that's something that I've got to actually learn about in the future. Yes uh, this is actually um, was a quite a coincidence because after I finished my bachelor thesis, which was not really uh, based on uh, textile analysis, but more on experimental approaches, because I was doing my master most of the time last year in Austria, I went to Vienna and it was a great opportunity because I was meeting Karina Grömer and she taught me everything she knows. So this was my jackpot really, because I was sucking all the information she gave to me and that's why I could do a very good master topic about the textiles from Slovenia, which were mineralized in burials from the Hallstatt period. And because of the preservation status of the textiles and because of Karina's big knowledge, I also gained the knowledge of using the microscope and gaining all the information and data from what I saw. And this actually helped develop a more scientific way of analyzing textiles for me, which I always wanted to achieve. So this was my open door <laughs> to work more in this way with textiles. So this is my goal. I want to work in a scientific way with the textiles and combine it, of course, with experimental archaeology and with the uh, scientific analysis is, um, is very important. And I want to show the people what you can achieve with like those rusty little pieces of textile because they are not that pretty. You know, if you want to talk about beautiful textiles in archaeology, you have to look at the salt mines or you have to look at the textiles from the ice or, you know, from everything that has better preservation conditions than just earth. <laughs> so, but I think it's showing that the data you can achieve from all those nice textiles is also important for the research. No, I agree. And when you were talking about these small rusty fragments or things that are have survived because they've become pseudomorphs on, on other objects and things like that. And people, you see people walking around museums or exhibitions and they look at this little fragment and to you and me and, and other people interested in this sort of thing, we can probably extrapolate ideas and things from that. But I see people looking at them and thinking, oh, that's a bit rubbish and you just I feel like I just want to jump in and go no 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 it's really exciting and but you never have any, any equipment and then you feel a bit of a nit when you do that because people look at you as if you're completely mad <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah but I think that's a good point because there is probably I mean here in Germany I can only speak about Berlin and Germany there's quite a big problem about showing the society what is textile archaeology and what you can achieve with it I mean we have a lot of museums here in Berlin and I know all the museums I was in them multiple times but uh, I haven't seen one single piece of textile or you know a reconstruction maybe of a I don't know bronze age man or woman or something about the iron age and there's just nothing <laughs> so really I'm really surprised at that yeah yeah I was working at a at an exhibition about the the Vikings which was a few years ago and there was so much you know possibilities to actually show a lot about textile archaeology you know a lot because the research is really well done in Denmark and Sweden and uh, there was just you know one sentence and I don't know one reconstruction talking about oh yeah that's how the Vikings looked period yeah. and that was really sad because people organizing these exhibitions seem to think that everyone's just interested in all the shiny metal work and swords and things like that they don't know themselves about textiles and how important they are at telling these wider 
bigger stories about populations and how if you don't have the right clothing or the right fabric to make sails and things you're not going to leave the house and you're definitely not going to get on a ship and go and find Iceland and and Greenland and places like that people are kind of dazzled by the shiny things aren't they really and then our textiles just get left to one side (laughs) I don't think it's quite as bad as that over here no I don't think so yeah I think it's better (laughs) Yeah, the, well, the British Museum have got some really nice displays of early medieval pieces. And if you're doing research and things like that, you can apply and they will agree to let you view and analyse pieces. And with the British Museum in particular, they've got a fantastic online database and catalogue that where a lot of their textiles you can bring up and they've got a number of photos and things like that of them. No 3D images like from your masters, but really clear high resolution images and things like that that you can use to study them and things. I wanted to to catch on the 3D thing because it is actually I think quite new in the textile archaeology field using 3D models for something because I know that the problem is with the 3D modeling you know textiles are mostly very flat and this is not very suitable for 3D reconstructions and that's why I was choosing to uh, 3D model the textile tools which should be considered together with the uh, textiles to gain a better overview of the production of the local production or maybe also showing how individual the people were who were producing the yarn and the 3D modeling actually is very common now on field work. Excavations are very often got documented via 3D and I'm doing it also myself in excavations. But I thought the possibility is really nice to document the spindle words or maybe some loom weights because future maybe reconstructions or someone who wants to make a new archaeological experiment with special spindle words want to know, you know, how it looks, how were were the sizes of the spindle wool, and uh, you don't have to drive to Austria to look at the spindle wool, so I can just upload the 3D model online, and you know, the person who wants to make a reconstruction of the spindle wool, he or she can use it whichever he or she wants. And I think that's a great possibility to just share all the information, because I don't want to own like the data, I don't want to own what I achieved, because I'm just one scientist who is working for the society. This is the way I see it. And I want to share the information and maybe someone can achieve something which I never thought of. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, just possibilities to work on it. And this is why I wanted to introduce the 3D modeling to textile (laughs) research or textile tool research, actually. Yeah, I think what you're saying is very true and it's really heartwarming that people out there are willing to share their knowledge and things like that. And especially within a community like Exart, because there are so many talented makers in the group who would be able to access what you, the images that you're producing um, and go on and make and then use experimental archaeology to see how these tools perform and to give was extra data and things like that. I mean, Eva Anderson Stroud, she's been using things like mocap um, computer technology and things to investigate the motion of spindle walls and how people spin and how that results on the finished thread that they produce and things like that. And I can see the kind of things that you're doing linking in with her kind of work quite nicely actually and I think it has quite exciting possibilities for the future for interdisciplinary research and bringing researchers, archaeologists and practitioners together on large projects that we never know where the results might lead really. Yeah sure absolutely you're totally right and uh, I know if you want to you know work with the spindle walls and what you said recreating yarn especially those uh, spindle walls and combining it with the textile finds we already have you know we always have to or I rely on experience on others because I don't know my my spinning experience for example is not that good I mean (laughs) I tried to spin since five years but if I have like an experiment in mind which um, depends on producing a lot of yarn 
in a time frame or in an experience frame from people, then I need to rely on others. And they don't, of course, need to be scientists. And this is actually a good citizen science project, combining thoughts and experience from people all over the world, doesn't matter, to join us in future projects and gaining more data to, you know, recreate the a part of the textile production in prehistoric times. Because me, myself, I can never achieve <laughs> reconstructing a textile production from the Iron Age. So you need more people for it. And these questions, yeah, they are, it would be nice if they sometimes can be answered. Yeah, but in inevitably they, they tend to give us more questions, don't they? <laughs> Actually, yes, yeah. <laughs> but you know, I don't have a problem with it because, I mean, if I'm working on textiles or textile tools, I will never be finished with something. I mean, there there will always be something you question and uh, someone who will, you know, give you more input and give you more ideas about your research. And that's why, I mean, I will probably always will deal with the textile fragments from Slovenia, from my master. So... I will hug them and love them and will always talk about them. So that's absolutely no problem because, you know, you, you need to have passion, I think, for textile archaeology and definitely to to stick on it and to always talk about probably the, the same topics and uh, tell people why it is so awesome what you're doing. And that's sometimes very difficult, I think, <laughs> convincing people, yeah. I know I've bored people to death with going on about early medieval embroidery and things like that, but you're so right, you've got to love it and be passionate about it. Because although new finds do turn up, it's not a very regular thing. You know in the back of your mind that you can always go back to things that you've studied before and with new technology or through collaborative working, you might learn something new and something that you never even considered before and that's what that's the great thing about collaborative working and talking to different people who have different skill sets and things it's really exciting because you never know what they're going to say i mean you might be sitting there going oh they're talking a load of rubbish and then all of a sudden it's like oh no actually that was a brilliant idea and it sends you off on a completely new direction that you'd never have thought of yourself just sat at your own on your owner's desk that's true. I'm really sad that this year we miss all the conferences because I was really looking forward to all the, the information I could share and maybe some more input from other scientists. So maybe we can see you all again next year. <laughs> yes. Were you going to Nice at? Yeah, I was. I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was my big plan to talk at Nice at about my research, but I will next year. So I'm still signed up for it. That's good. I'm planning on going next year as well. So um, that would be great. I don't know if we need to explain what NISAT is. Maybe we should, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. NISAT is a group that's been set up for a number of years now, and it's called the North European Textile Symposium. And it happens every three years, is it? And the idea was that there were people studying textiles across Europe and now the world, who it would be great to meet up and to, to discuss their work and spread knowledge and, and gain understanding in a collaborative form. But there wasn't really a forum to do that. So that's why NISAT was set up. And I've been meaning to try and get there for a number of years, but I always kept missing the deadlines. But a friend told me this time, she emailed me and said, the deadline's coming up, get on with it, Alex. So I did, and I got in. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then it was yeah, cancelled. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, me too. I was in Vienna when the deadline came up and Karina was pushing me, you know, to sign up for it. And I did. And, uh, you know, I was really glad <laughs> that my topic was, was good enough for Lisa. But um, yeah, next year we will all talk about our topics together. I am really looking forward to it. Yeah, I think it's going to be a good one because um, there seems to be quite a lot of uh, interesting papers and, and things. I can't remember a lot of the titles off the top of my head, but I don't know. Pete, that would probably bore listeners, actually, if we went started going into too much detail. To be honest, I think the listeners for today will be really interested in it, but I might just cut in. And that sounds a really good thing. And we will be adding a link to the podcast page as well for anyone who's interested in that conference. 
I actually had a little question. Do you think, talking about sort of conferences and people who are studying textiles, do you think that there's any gaps in our knowledge of sort of textiles, either in the past or modern studies of textile, that need to be filled? Wow, that's a big question. It is. I mean, there are gaps, of course. You know, we have so few textile fragments or textile finds that through different periods of times, there are always gaps. Because of the preservation problem, of course, textiles are very fragile and only very special conditions lead to organic preservation. And especially in the middle European part, it's very difficult if you don't have a special bog or you have like a special burial mound where you have special bacteria who are preserving the textiles. It is very difficult and I think you can never achieve a full overview of one big prehistoric society with the data we have now so no i i agree with you there and from an embroidery point of view as well particularly from the period i've studied we have a number of surviving embroideries but there's very little equipment that's being classified as being used for embroidery so you there's the two sides of it for the fact that we have little textile surviving but then you also get in some instances few pieces of equipment surviving and so then you've got big questions around well this this, for me this embroidery looks fine you've got embroidery stitches of a millimeter long and things like this well what were they using we know they were using needles but needles made from different types of metal or bone work better with certain fabrics and fibres than with others. And so this opens up really good opportunities for experimental archaeology and exploring different tool sets and things like that. And also, if a new find comes to light, that opens up new questions and it might enable you to fill some of the gaps, but then it might open up new gaps and things like that. We've not really defined what kind of gaps there are, but there are so many that it's, um, yeah, we'd be here forever, really, I suppose, in a positive way. Yeah. Uh, Alex, do you have some archaeological finds of needles from the early Middle Ages? Yeah, we have a lot of finds from known and presumed female graves. Some of them are children's graves as well, mainly from, you would say, Viking period. And some of them are are beautiful. You get lovely containers made from bone or metal and inside there are needles, uh, some of which have been threaded through a little bit of fabric just to keep them safe and things like that. And there are um, scissors or shears which have always been given symbolic functions. They're normally found attached to the chatelaine and the girdle, but the size of the blades are the same as the size of blades for modern day embroidery scissors and things like that. So personally, I'd like to do some experimental work linked to those finds. We've got no embroidery frames though, which isn't surprising because they would have been made of wood. Yeah, that's, I think the the textile tool problem is also really big because I was working in my bachelor thesis about uh, the rigid heddle and the you know the rigid heddle is also a tool made out of wood or out of bone and it's way more prominent in the roman period but i was investigating it in northern europe and it is very hard to lay a finger on the rigid heddle because i think most of the wooden finds who were excavated quite early weren't even identified as a textile tool because they are very simple looking you know there's probably just a stick left on it and uh, maybe a little hole and that's it and uh, it's always difficult to collect those finds and this is another gap you know maybe you have the textile but you don't have the tool or the loom or something and you have to make up your mind what was used and have to experiment a lot with it so you maybe achieve different techniques and different methods for the same result at the end so i think there's always two truths how to create a textile. Yes, and that's one of the things why I I like an interdisciplinary approach as well, because sometimes you might find in written sources or in art sources and things, a little snippet of something and all of a sudden it pings in your mind and you think, oh, actually that could be a 
whatever. And then you can go back and look at things, objects that have been excavated, that have been classed as miscellaneous or unknown, and they link in with these written or visual descriptions. And then you can move on to having recreations made and experimenting and things like that. So it's working with archaeological textiles is a really interdisciplinary thing. And I that's one of the things I love about it. Yes, definitely, definitely. Actually, sorry, if I could just uh, tag in on there, you're sort of mentioning a kind of interdisciplinarity so almost sort of diversity shall we say uh within the kind of genre i just wanted to come in because um we try to make sure that we're sort of on online with uh, current topics in the world right now and i think that something like textile research is a really good example because it is an in such an international thing i mean all over the world usually there was some kind of clothing or textile or something uh going on uh in that respect so how do you think that textile research can highlight sort of past and also present diversity in this respect? Do you think it can or? I think it can, perhaps not as in specific ways, but I mean, if you're taking, again, my area of study, the early medieval period was particularly in what's now England. Um, people were very outward looking and they were interacting with other territories, other cultures across Europe and through into Byzantium and taking their ideas sharing their own knowledge with them bringing materials precious materials like silks and and things like that into early medieval england and using those to make embroideries and then these embroideries were then going back out into the wider world and so by doing that people were interacting with viking age traders and we know that the frisians were coming over and they were at the court of alfred and so in that sense, it is a very diverse area of study because you're not just focusing on England, you're actually looking at the Western world and through into China as well in some cases. What would you say, when you're about the period you're studying? Yes, uh, definitely. I was trying to look, you know, around Slovenia because uh, Slovenia in the, in the early Iron Age was part of the bigger eastern Hallstatt region and you know, there is evidence for you know some kind of trade especially from the eastern part but also from the western Hallstatt area and I wanted to look if we can see it in the textiles because the specific thing about the eastern Hallstatt textiles are they are produced mainly by single yarn and the western Hallstatt textiles were mostly produced with applied yarn. And there are some, some very few evidence in the eastern Hallstatt region, especially also in the Slovenian burials, where we have also plied yarn textiles. And combining this with the other objects inside the graves, like some metal objects or some weapons, you can see clearly a contact between different regions. And that the plied yarn textiles are probably traded or were presents doesn't matter, from the uh, western Hallstatt area. I tried to look at other countries like Italy and Greece, everything that is surrounding Slovenia, but there's of course always the problem that not in every country there is a textile archaeologist who is looking at the textiles. So there are some blank countries at the moment. I, I wanted to look at the, you know, at the Czech Republic or at uh, Slovakia or, you know, some countries around it, but there is if maybe there is material, but there's no one who is dealing with it. And so there are some problems because, you know, modern borders are not the same as uh, 3000 years ago. So you have to always look at other countries around your sites. No, that was, I think that's an interesting point as well, actually. I mean, you mentioned, Ronja, that you, I mean, you're, you were in a a big German university and you found it difficult to find someone to help you with the textile research. So someone who's in, uh, I don't know, a country where maybe it's not quite such a international university or it's a smaller scale university would find it even more difficult perhaps to get into textile research or for it to be even a topic. <laughs> yes, of course, absolutely. 
Last year I was in Poland for a conference and they are doing a lot of interesting stuff with also uh, medieval textile finds. They have quite a lot, but it's sometimes difficult for the universities to step outside and share the information. Maybe just because it's a problem of money, you know, maybe they cannot afford attending conference, you know, and then you have to somehow get the information <laughs> in another way. But that's very difficult if you don't have the possibility from your university yeah, to share your information. So thank you both of you very much for that very interesting discussion. Um, as a final question, before we open this up to the live session, what are your plans for the future? I know that, for example, you're working on a blog together. We mentioned that before. You feel free to uh, talk about that a little if you want, but also any other plans you have. And uh, obviously, this is a show run by Exarch. How can the Exarch community, how can we help to make a difference in regards to the points that you have discussed today? Uh, well, with regards to the blog, I've set this blog up. It's entitled Early Medieval Mostly Textiles. And the first post went out on the 1st of July. Ronya's post uh, is out on the 1st of August. And it's the idea behind it is to spread the amazingness, if that's a word, of particularly early medieval textiles and, and their decoration and how they were made um, and how people use them and study them today. So although the blog is entitled Early Medieval, because there's so many exciting finds and fascinating analysis being done on them from outside the early medieval time frame, people are going to be uploading posts linked to those um, textiles as well. So, and the, uh, the main aim is for it to be inclusive. So whole world and it doesn't matter what your background is, whether you're a maker or a researcher, whether you do it as a hobby or whether um, you, you do it as a job. The information is out there for people to learn more and to become interested in them. And uh, hopefully there will be a post a month and it's free. That's important that it's accessible to people. So from my point of view to do with the blog, members of that, I'm always interested in what textile makers or people who make tools are doing and XART members who are involved in that sort of thing are more than welcome to contact me um, if they want to put a post on the blog about it. But Ronnie is actually writing about her MA work. So, and there's going to be some amazing images and, and things and some of her 3D work is going to be linked to it and things like that as well. Ooh. I was just about to ask, will we get to see the 3D images? I'm intrigued. <laughs> yes. Yes, you will. Yeah, I'm giving my best. <laughs> yeah, and I have a husband who works in IT so he can make it all work. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> we can make it work. I am looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, if uh, the textile blog with Alex is uh, just one opportunity for me to reach out to the people. Since last year, I'm really into Science Slam. In Germany, we have quite a big community who are organizing Science Slams all over Germany. And different people from different areas can yeah, tell people what they're doing in a 10-minute frame. And I think this is a great opportunity to... Uh, reach people who are not always scientists and who, who don't really know what archaeology or textile archaeology is. And um, I'm always linking this to the situation that, you know, clothing or dress is really important for us today and was also 3000 years ago. And I think this always catches people, you know, to talk with me about this and why it is so, so good what I am doing. And this is something where I'll really have uh, fun and I want to, to do this, um, you know, again when everything is open <laughs> because you need a stage and <laughs> you need uh, people to see you. Yeah, and I hopefully uh, hopefully can uh, work uh, more with textiles in, uh, in a PhD project. I hope this will somehow will work out for me. But in the meantime, I am doing um, some more 3D reconstructions. I'm doing my, my weaving and uh, sewing and I'm doing my reconstructions for my Iron Age uh, dress to show it to people. And maybe I can... Yeah, we have in, in Berlin um, a muse um, an open air museum 
and there's always a good opportunity to uh, talk to the visitors and uh, to show some techniques about weaving and spinning and maybe connect with uh, other reenactors or people doing living history and yeah doing things together mostly <laughs> no, sounds great okay so i hope you enjoyed that discussion we will now be having a live question and answer session with all of you who have been listening in we have our first question from nalana so in relation to the gaps that there are in textile archaeology which we were talking about earlier what can other disciplines do do you think to build on the picture which has sort of already partially arisen from finds and from analysis. So how can other disciplines help textile archaeology? We talked about interdisciplinarity and this should be always a goal to work together with different parts of archaeology. If we're talking about, for instance, fiber analysis and what we can gain information from it, we should always also ask zoological analysis about maybe sheep or horse and other animals or even biological traces for fabrics which are made by plants. We should always have a bigger overview to other archaeological disciplines in basic. Would you have anything to add to that, Alex? So from my point of view, because I do a lot of work linked to the art side of things and things like that, I'm always interested in what those studying early medieval art think about, say, the layout of images and things. I mean, the Bayer Tapestry is a really interesting one in that sense, because we obviously look at things from a modern Western perspective, but actually during the early medieval period, they weren't looking at things in that way. So I'm always interested in what art historians are thinking, but also what other professional embroiderers would think. So I think you've got the scientific side of things and you've also got the art and the humanities side that can bring together lots of interdisciplinary approaches that can give you really exciting answers or avenues in which to explore your medium. Okay, great. Thanks for that. So we have another question, more specifically for Alex, but probably Ronnie, I'm sure you'll have something to say on this. You said that a lot of your questions for embroidery relates to the absence of many of the tools. Are there any techniques which you've seen from the past that you think might have been produced with tools which aren't used today? So is there a gap between what you see they've accomplished on the textiles and what our modern tools would enable you to do? No. Quick answer. So that was a really quick answer. I'm thinking this through. No, I think most of the things that I've seen on the surviving um, embroideries can be produced with the tools that are available today. Obviously, this is focused on early medieval embroidery produced in what's now the British Isles and Ireland. It may be different when you look at embroidery from other countries, but that's an area that I, I need to explore in more detail. So I wouldn't want to say yes or no to the wider picture, really. Fair enough. Still interesting, I think, and also interesting for future research, definitely, it sounds like. Another question for Alex. Was embroidery something that many people did in medieval times, or was it more of a high-class thing? During the early medieval period, the evidence is that most women did embroidery. Not everyone would have done it as a profession. And obviously, the early medieval period spans approximately AD 450 to I go up to 1100. So it's a really long time span. So at the beginning of that period, um, you get probably young girls sitting with the elders in their local village or within their family learning to embroider. And then by the end of the period, um, I suggested that there are more workshop type settings and things like that as running alongside what you could call independent concerns. And then you have a high class, the women from elite circles and royal circles were embroidering they were doing it more as I suppose you could say possibly a vocation but as it was seen as a worthy occupation as well they weren't embroidering as an income as a job really moving into the later period I can't really answer that I would suggest that most people were continuing to embroider but then of course you get the guilds coming in and it becoming more professionalized and men were taking over as a result of things like that so women would continue to have embroidered but from a professional point of view men were also beginning to become involved as well it's an interesting it's almost like I, i'm just thinking of something like chefs or you know working with food as well at some point everyone thinks oh you know making food it's just for women but then actually professionally you know if it would be a male chef it's sort of a yeah it's an interesting disparity um, in those things 
Ronya, I will ask you a question now. So Caroline is wondering what 3D capture method you use. Yes, I did it with a structure from motion, which is basically taking pictures of an object from a lot of different angles. And those pictures are later getting into a program. Uh, there are multiple ones. You can use some uh, open source software or you can buy some stuff. I am using most of the time uh, Agisoft Photoscan, which is a uh, very easy to use and is also quite nice when you don't make that nice pictures and it will put out a 3D model, uh, which is very convenient. And uh, it also can be used for other projects later on. You can save it as a PDF model. You can save it in a hundred other files. And you can also, we thought about actually uh, printing out a spindle wall later because it uh, connects quite well with the 3D printers. And uh, Structure for Motion is quite cheap because you only need a camera and nothing else. For other 3D techniques, you can buy also scanners but they cost a lot of money and, you know, I'm just a poor student. So I have a camera and I take the pictures and I get quite uh, convenient 3D models out of it. Okay, perfect. So it's a photogrammetry method. Yeah, yeah, it's basically photogrammetry. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. For Maeve, we have another question. Are the STL files for the 3D models of those tools, will they be available online? Uh, yes, there is uh, one spindle wall online on the website Sketchfab. Sketchfab is quite a nice website where people or institutes can upload their 3D models. Also, I think the British Museum has quite a lot of uh, 3D models uploaded there. It's for free. You can check it online. I have an account there. It's named Ronja Lau, of course. <laughs> and there's this, uh, this um, spindle wall online, uh, which I was making for my master thesis. And you can spin it around. You can look at it from every site you would like. And in addition, the Spindle Wars also found that the blog post Alex and I launched at the 1st of August on her website. So you can read about it also there. So we have another question for Valentema. So I might ask this to Alex first and then to you, Rania. Do the speakers, so both of you, think that textiles might have been ignored by broader researchers or, you know, broader exhibits in museums because it's considered as a craft work or women's work as opposed to kind of artisanal or men's work. So, you know, obviously there's a high degree of skill involved, of course, but do you think that people see it in a different light to other crafting technologies? So maybe Alex first? I think people do generally see it more as craft work. Um, and that goes back to this whole business of the Renaissance and when the hierarchy of art slash craft work was, say, put in place, but became popular. And that's come down to us today. But I think with the idea of broader research or exhibitions, I think that can also link in with what's popular and in both research contexts, particularly if you're looking for funding and things like that. And with exhibits, obviously, if it's within a museum context, people need to draw in the public in order to make these things work. And so they're also looking at things that are going to do that. So I think it's a combination of a lot of different factors that have contributed to that. I hope that answers your question. No, I definitely think so. So Ronya, would you agree? Do you think that it's seen in a different light to other crafting techniques or technologies? I, yeah, maybe yes, but maybe it is also like a more older yeah, tradition because I can imagine that in Germany, the research tradition about archaeology and, and basic was not focused on things like that. It was about jewelry and about the, you know, bling bling stuff. And I know that we have a collection at our university with a lot of nice textile related archaeological finds and we know that i don't know a hundred years ago they scrapped the textiles off and throw them away on the metal object so it was not that important and the focus on those small things was quite a few years out of the mind of archaeologists and maybe it's just slowly getting back and you know because of the very few textiles we have i think a lot of people find it very difficult to even say something about uh, textile textile archaeology in an exhibition. The craft work maybe is getting better even also with uh, recreating other crafts as woodworking or metalworking and stuff and maybe uh, textiles can you know jump on that train and <laughs> make it more interesting too for an exhibition to talk about that. So yeah maybe those both sides. Thank you to you both. We have another question here from Hanukkah, a very specific one, I like this question. Is medieval ladies' underwear and sanitary products 
Do either of you have any information or tips about literature on this topic? Is it something that's well known or well researched? What materials could have been used? Are there any finds, maybe specifically kind of 12th to 14th century that you know of? So perhaps uh, Alex first. I don't know the dates, but I know that they did find possible sanitary products in a cave in Israel. Now, I'm not sure if that's been published or not, but I think Hero Granger Taylor has done some research on that. And then if you look up, oh, what is her name? Orit, I can't remember her last name now. She's a textile archaeologist in Israel. She's the textile archaeologist in Israel. So if you look her up on academia or something like that, she may have written about that. There was a thing to do in Austria where they thought they found some bras, but apparently they're not bras anymore. So apart, but specifically to the 12th or 14th century, I can't help you, sorry. <laughs> No, no worries. Well, it still sounds very fascinating anyway. It's, again, what you were saying before about the fact, what Ronnie was mentioning in terms of like, oh, you know, you just focus on the bling bling. I guess most things probably just focus on the pretty dresses and how nice it looks rather than, mm, did they have uh, sanitary products back then? Um, do you know of any uh, examples, Ronnie? Have you come across any literature on this topic? Yeah, I have something in mind, but I have absolutely no idea where I saw that. So I'm really sorry. It's yeah, that's similar to what Alex was saying. It sounds like, no, that's fine. For those of you who are listening, the links will all be available. Hanukkah, to answer your question, there is something there. Katrin Kanya has just messaged to say that it's Orit Shamir who's in Israel. Yes, there we go. And uh, yes, Lengberg does have bras, but only one fragment turned out to be a cap. I also have another question for you. So obviously, Alex, you're a professionally trained embroider. Ron, you, you taught yourself a lot about how to sew. You already mentioned a little bit the sort of troubles in terms of you had to find someone to teach you and all that aspect. But do you think that people should already have a working knowledge of techniques to do with sewing in order to start textile archaeology? Or is it something that you can pick out? Perhaps Rania, if you want to go first. Oh, yes. <laughs> it maybe helps to get started in textile archaeology if you have basic knowledge about how textiles are made. But if you're really into it and you say, oh, I wanted to start with textile archaeology, but I don't know anything about it, but you're very eager and passionate about it, I mean, you can learn it. That's nothing to, it's, you know, it's not rocket science. You can learn how to sew and you can learn how to weave. It maybe takes others um, some while, but it's not mandatory, you know, to work with textile archaeology and the finds. Would you agree, Alex? Yes, I do agree. And at Glasgow University, for example, as part of, I think it's the MA course, they do introductory modules for people who are interested in that sort of thing. And a lot of those people don't have a background in textiles, but that module builds up the knowledge and helps you understand. So yes, having some background does help. And I think it also helps steer you in the direction that you would like to go. But at a university that if you were going down the university route a university that has modules and things like that should be able to help you develop the knowledge and the skills that you need I don't know if there are any apprenticeships or anything like that in textile archaeology there aren't any in the UK as far as I'm aware that would be really good actually if there were specifically in textile archaeology you mean rather than necessarily like rather than embroidery or yeah, I'm talking about textile archaeology in particular in that instance, um, because then you get really good hands on, wouldn't you, um, working with with people on a day to day basis. I mean, my my training at the Royal School was classed as an apprenticeship and it's a it's a brilliant way to learn. So, yeah, I was just wondering if um, there was anything like that anywhere in the world. Yeah, I'm not uh, sure. And as Yasmin has just posted in the group as well, I find that so many sort of makers and craftspeople and textile enthusiasts are very happy to share their knowledge with, with people. Dorothy mentions Bakadal's Folk High School in Sweden. She teaches courses on ancient textile techniques, apparently. And there's a summer school at the CTR, which is great. And uh, the TRC in Leiden, uh, apparently, also offers a very in-depth introduction course. So for those of you who are interested but haven't quite got around to uh, learning the skills yet, then this is your chance. It's a nice sharing community, it seems. We have a question from Roland. Do you recognise apprentices' work in archaeological material? Perhaps first for Alex? I haven't up till now, but obviously from my period, you've got the issue of how much survives. 
But for the Bayer Tapestry, for instance, you can tell the different people, the different hands working on it. I haven't looked at it in the aspect of whether it was an apprentice or not, though. That's quite an interesting thing. I'm going to have to go back to it and, and have a look. Rania, do you have any examples of potential trainees or apprenticeships in your work? I think it's pretty hard to lay a finger on it. it. I did not occur in my work, but I have read about some, yeah, weaving mistakes or, you know, yarn that is spun too much or, yeah, things like this. But, you know, maybe it was just the person who had a really hard day and was not focusing very well <laughs> and made a mistake or it was someone who was learning this new technique and was making a mistake in that way. So pff, if there is not a written source or something with a picture on it I think it's not true it's a lot based a lot on assumption I imagine yes yes it's not yeah 100% said that this mistake was made by a learning person I have a slightly more fun question for you what is your favorite or your sort of most interesting result that you've had in your work so far perhaps Rania first I've got loads I suppose from a PhD it would be there's tiny fragments from Kempston, which is in Bedfordshire, uh, there was um, a fragment of embroidery was found in a, they're called work boxes, they're not work boxes, they're, bron- they're small round bronze boxes that was found um, in what's supposedly a female inhumation burial and we was able to rewrite the design and therefore a possible history for it. So that was really cool. And then At the moment, I'm working on analysis of a piece from Winchester that could be really exciting, but I can't go into too much detail about. And then I've got my Cuthbert recreation project where I'm using equipment and threads and materials that are as close to the originals as possible. So things like hand-woven ground fabric and silk that's been naturally dyed and things like that. And I'm re- and I'm, it's really exciting because I'm learning a lot about the working methods and the thinking processes that would have been employed during the creation of the manor pool that we just, was discovered in the tomb of St. Cuthbert at Durham Cathedral. As you can see, I get very excited about these things very easily. I was about to say, I can tell you're excited. Yeah, no, it's good. It's great. No, it does sound very interesting, though. It sounds like a great project indeed. It, yeah, it's, it's a bit slow at the moment because of other things impinging on it and COVID-19 and all that malarkey. But I will get back to it. I will. OK, sounds great. Well, hopefully uh, people can check in with your progress as well at different points. I imagine there will probably be blog posts about it on the blog at some point. Yes, there are blog posts and I post on Instagram about it as well. Yes. Perfect. So if anyone's interested in following that. So uh, Ronya, same question. Yes, I, I made up my mind and I think I was talking about this plight yarn occasion in Slovenia and maybe this sounds for others a little bit lame, but the Slovenian textiles I was working on were uh, basically fitting the image of the Eastern Hallstatt textile production picture. And I was very confident and excited to see this one product which was made of uh, plied yarn and was obviously not local but uh, came from another area, which was probably uh, the Western Hallstatt region. And finding this in this uh, three small cemeteries in Slovenia was quite a check it off my list. I found it (laughs) and there's the evidence and I was really excited about that. This is a very small piece. It was just one and a half centimeter small piece of textile. But, you know, finding it and... I think in this group, the people listening today will not find that lame at all. (laughs) Probably, yes. I always imagine talking to people who are not into textile archaeology and explaining everything, you know, from the beginning. And uh, yeah, I have to remember myself. Yeah, true. All the people here are very interested in textile archaeology. So yeah, this was, was my greatest find. But I have multiple occasions where I just see that the work I do is also reaching people and, you know, all the moments I have with other people are also a very good bonus, you know, and having good experiences and meeting people and all the time. And this is also very pleasing me in my work. Yeah, I can imagine. Fun part of it. We have, I think, the last question here from Maeve. I am not sure about the technical specifics of this question, but hopefully one of you can answer it. Did you see any patterns with S or Z spin preference when you compared the Western to the Eastern yarns? S and Z spun yarns, they occur in the Eastern region quite often and are, let me see, I have it here written down somewhere. Uh, The spinning patterns, 
Uh, the spinning patterns in Slovenia show that both spinning techniques were used. So we have Z and S spawn yarn and Z was probably used more often. And uh, I don't have the exact graph in mind what's it with the western part, but um, as they mostly use plied yarn, I think it was uh, S and Z, Z spun, but I'm not sure at the moment. I haven't written that down. So. <laughs> But as the yarns in the eastern part were spin mostly in Z and S and were used in also in one textile to produce like a special pattern with it. That was quite often. For those of us who don't know, what is S or Z spin yarns? If you're spinning yarn, you have two possibilities to spin the spindle wall, either in one direction or in the other. And you can see that in the yarn in which direction you have spun it. And it's, we say S and Z because if you look at the yarn, it has a diagonal pattern, either in one direction or in the other. And because it looks like an S, we say S. And because it looks like a Z, we say Z. Yes, that's it, basically. I'll ask one more last question from myself before. How do you feel, both of you obviously do a lot of experimental archaeology, how do you think that experimental archaeology broadens or aids the interpretive process of textile research rather than sort of just looking at it as a, as a yeah, 2D thing, I suppose? The experimental archaeology and experimenting with tools and techniques is very important because, yeah, you can look at a textile and, and think mm, maybe it was made in this way, but you are probably not 100% sure. And uh, you should always try to prove your thesis. I mean, in other sciences... This is a basic way you have a hypothesis and you're testing it by an experiment and then afterwards you say, okay, it's true or false. And I think uh, with textile archaeology, you can always do the same and it adds good points for your interpretation or maybe changes your mind over something, or over a find or a technique and it's just evolving. And yourself as a scientist, you are evolving uh, during experiment and afterwards your work is uh, maybe richer about your knowledge than before. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Anything to add, Alex? Yes, I agree with what Ronya's just said. And also for me, I'm quite interested in a theory called sensory archaeology, where archaeologists look use the, ex the senses to explore people's possible interactions with different environments and objects, etc. So for the experimental side of things, it gives you that I'm going to say personal insight, although that's quite difficult because for me, the person is long dead. But it gives you um, a deeper insight into how that person might have been feeling, how their joints might have ached, for instance, after spending so long bent over an embroidery frame. If you're having a bad day, you can imagine what they were thinking. There's a wider theoretical side that can also be inputted and interpreted through experimental archaeology, as well as exploring would that bronze needle work with such fine embroidery or was it used for heavy embroidery, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are wide applications that experimental archaeology can be used for, but and they can also answer the, re the bigger questions, um, how people were thinking and feeling about how work environments were set up and that sort of thing as well. I'm afraid we, we have run out of time. So thank you very much. Alex and to Ronya for joining us today and uh, sharing your experience, your expertise in this area. I definitely learned a lot. I now know all about S and Z patterns. Um, so I'm sure that our uh, listeners did too. So thank you very much, both of you, for coming and joining us today. Well, thank you for asking. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone else uh, who's here for listening to this episode of uh, Finally Friday by Exarch. So uh, if you'd like to become more involved with Exarch, why not become a member? Alternatively, you can make a small PayPal donation through the website to help Exarch in its future endeavors. And don't forget to keep an eye on the website for future updates in regards to the conference and to episodes of Finally Friday. So see you next month for another episode of Finally Friday. Bye.